All right. We're going to go ahead and get started. So a few announcements. Uh, one, as a reminder, our exam is on Friday. Uh, the morning of our exam at 8 a.m., I will, I will be somewhere. I need to find out if this room is available or if we have to use a different room. It will either be in this room or it will be in RCSM room 10, which is downstairs, probably where you have organismic lab. Um, and, and doing an exam review. And I know that's the same day of the exam, but hopefully by that point you have some of the, at least some of the questions that you still need answered, you have those identified. Um, but yeah, at 8 a.m. on the morning of our exam, I will be either in here or in RCSM 10, I'll let you know which, um, by email uh, to do some exam review and preparation for Friday's exam. If you can't make it, I'm sorry, send your questions to me ahead of time and I will gladly respond to those via email, okay? Uh, I will record that session like I do our lecture sessions and uh, put that uh, on, on YouTube, but again, that requires that you have some time on Friday to do it before we have class, which I know you have, most of you have Gen Kim right before this and, you know, then you have chapel. And so it, it's interesting if you can't make the 8 a.m. how much you're going to be able to make use of that. Uh, but that will be available. Um, I haven't graded your homeworks yet from last week. I was going to do it this morning, and I didn't. I'm sorry if you're, like, eagerly waiting to find out how your homework will be scored for last week. I apologize that I haven't graded them yet. Uh, I try to grade materials quickly, including exams, maybe even especially exams. Um, and so, uh, yeah. And as I said last week, I do have your quizzes. If you want them, feel free to, to ask for them. I'm not going to hand them back because there are a lot of you, and that would take a lot of time. And, uh, yeah, and I don't want to. So, all right. The, oh, one more announcement. Uh, I put these slides up on Canvas at about 6.30, and then I realized that there were some typos, like seven of them on the same slide. So I went and fixed those and put it back on there, I think somewhere around 7.30 or 7.45. So if you got the slide somewhere in between 6.30 and 8 o'clock, you may have a version of the slides that have uh, just a lot of typos on one of the slides. I apologize for that. Um, yeah, it happens. I fixed it. But you may not have gotten the correct version. So I think that's it as far as announcements go. Unless there are any questions that we can settle as a group. Okay, so we are going a little bit out of order. You probably noticed that if you're looking ahead on modules and you're, you're paying attention to where you ought to be preparing, you realized we skipped a chapter, we skipped a chapter on fungi. We're gonna come back to it. We're not gonna leave those mushrooms alone. I mean, we're gonna talk about them, uh, but I, I think it's better and makes more sense to discuss plants before you discuss fungi and animals, because fungi and animals are in the same group of eukaryotes, Opisthocanta. And so I think you ought to actually talk through them at the same time and not actually spread them apart. I don't know why this, this textbook does that. I don't know. So I fixed it for them and fixed it for you. All right? Yeah. If that angers you, I'm sorry, but the textbook was free. So what are you going to do about it, you know? All right. No questions, thoughts? So I know I went through that fast, but like I'm just I'm fired up, you know? It's a good day. It's a great day. Happy Monday. I love Mondays. All right, let me pray. <sighs> Father, thank you so much uh, for a, just a, another opportunity that we have to get together. Father, I understand that I have an incredible uh, responsibility with regards to the stewardship of these students' uh, education uh, in this course. Father, I pray that with your spirit, you would equip me to steward that well. Help me to think clearly and speak clearly and prepare well, Father, that our time together can be well spent and productive and uh, that we can accomplish a great deal and that when this semester is over, that these students are better equipped to, to think through uh, this material and better equipped to steward the world that you've made and steward your grace and love. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So chapter 25, and yes, yeah, we skipped chapter 24. We'll come back to it in a couple of chapters. So this week we'll do seedless plants. Next week we'll do seed plants, and then we'll come back and do fungi. Oh, by the way, this material is not on Friday's exam. 
So you probably noticed that if you look through the study guide already, which is posted on Canvas, Friday's exam covers only the material that we went through last week. Okay, so it covers viruses, bacteria, and archaea, and uh, protists. All right, <clears throat> so our framing questions for this week. Why don't land plants have some of the pigments that you find in red and brown algae, or algae? Algae is actually the proper way to pronounce it, but I don't know whether or not I like the way that sounds, so I don't use it very often. Uh, how do algae produce drought-resistant structures? Oh, why do? I said how, didn't I? Why do they produce? We won't talk about the how. Mechanics is way beyond what we need to cover for this class. If you want to know how, we can talk about that, but beyond this course. Uh, why can mosses grow where there isn't any soil? It's fantastic. Uh, how do bryophytes compare? The bryophytes are the mosses and some others, liverworts, hornworts. Uh, why are vascular plants larger than non-vascular plants? And then finally, which are considered the most derived seedless vascular plants? It is my goal to get through the first four of these today. Are we going to meet that goal? Probably not. But that is my goal. All right? So I don't know why I told you that, except for maybe if you're wondering, like, why are we pushing here when we feel like we should be, you know, <coughs> bless you, when we should be just relaxing, that's why. All right? So first framing question. Ooh, that makes me really angry that it all came up at once. All right, first question. Uh, why don't land plants have some of the pigments in red and brown algae? All right, so let's go back to our phylogeny that we worked on last time. I think it was on Friday, maybe it was on Wednesday, when somebody asked, okay, well, where does this all fit together? So we've got this original ancestor of all living forms, right? All of our survival machines. Viruses aren't on here, why? Because they're not living, right? So we don't have to deal with viruses in the same way. Although, I think there's a good reason to think viruses do actually belong on here because they came from living organisms. Anyways, another discussion for another time. Sorry if my enthusiasm is going to bother you today, but I don't know what happened. Like in the drive in, I mean, it wasn't anything abnormal, but I just, I got fired up. I don't know what happened. <laughs> so here we have bacteria off on their own, believed to best represent this original ancestor of all living organisms, right? And then so we get over here, this branch representing uh, our group that includes archaea and eukaryotes. So we've got over here, we've got archaea. <clears throat> and so uh, there are a number of reasons of why this is assumed, why eukaryotes are believed to be more closely related to archaeans than they are to bacteria, which is interesting. I know because your extremophiles are almost all archaeans. And you're like, well, the early earth was extreme, was it not? And so the answer is yes, but these bacteria that we have are remnants of those extreme bacteria. Anyways, it's complicated. And then we get into eukaryotes, and here we have our five-way polytomy. Right, just a big mess. We talked about this, yes. Some of you did not mention this on your quiz as, you know, issues that you have to kind of overcome if you're going to think through rooting all eukaryotes back to a single ancestor. This should be your go-to, the first thing you mention. Unless you're, the first things you're going to mention is that it's inconsistent with what Scripture teaches about origins, that's an okay first thing to go to. In fact, if we want to get it, anyways, sorry. So then we have excavata, we have chrome, alveolata, we have archaeplastida, and this is what we're talking about over the next couple of weeks. Archaeplastida, this group of eukaryotes that includes plants. Okay, we're talking about seedless plants this week, and so here's where they are. Then we have amoebozoa, yeah. I don't know if I ever told you this, but I don't care very much about spelling. So if it's spelled phonetically correct, that's good with me. Okay? Because I don't care enough to make sure I know it's spelled exactly correctly. I think this is correct, but honestly, I don't care. 
And so if I don't care about working hard enough to make sure I spell it correctly, I don't care for you either, as long as it's phonetically correct. Because if it's not phonetically correct, meaning if it doesn't read the same, it means you really didn't know what the word was. You're just kind of grasping for things, right? Like, oh, I think it's something like this, right? Starts with a P, and then you just scribble, making, making, thinking like, oh, yeah, I just, like, when I come to that, I'll just, oh, yeah, they totally nailed it. They must have just been writing really fast. <laughs> And then finally, epistocanta. And this is why I think it's best to do fungi immediately before you start talking about animals, because they're, they're in the same supergroup of eukaryotes. So you ought to treat them together, at least in my opinion. Okay, so we're talking about Archeplastida. Inside of this group are plants and green algae. That's it. No other eukaryotic group is within Archeplastida. You've got plants and green algae. So right away, uh, we, if you wanted to address this question really simply right away without talking about all this extra stuff, why don't land plants have some of the pigments in red and brown algae? Because they don't share a photosynthetic ancestor, right? The only ancestor they would share, which all the rest of our algal groups are here, the only ancestor they share is the ancestor of all eukaryotes, which probably wasn't a photosynthetic organism. I don't think ever existed. <laughs> Another question altogether. But even if it did, was likely not a photosynthetic organism. So you could treat it that way, right? Completely different supergroup of eukaryotes, and you could address it that way. So then if you want to get into some more detail, there's evidence that green algae and plants have chloroplasts that we would think would be structured uh, during a primary endosymbiotic event in a similar way that the mitochondrion is believed to have formed where you engulf an actual bacterium, in this case, a photosynthetic cyanobacterium, and enslave it, essentially, uh, to, to be a chloroplast. We talked about some of the issues with that, with mitochondria, same issues with chloroplast. Just the machinery necessary to make that happen doesn't exist. And so you have a lot of issues with that. But again, so plants and carophytes, carophytes are green algae. So plants and caryophytes are believed to have a common ancestor, and so whereas the rest of the algal groups, are, they're convergent with them. Yes, they're all photosynthetic, but that instance of photosynthesis would be convergent evolution in that it's shared features but different ancestry, right? And so either that convergence is designed, right? You've got the same form and you have separate created kinds, or that same morphology was produced with convergent evolution, right? I'm sorry if it distracted you that all the words came on the slide at once. It distracted me too. So we're in the same boat. I'm sorry. Uh, algae have to deal with sunlight. Oh, that is filtered by water and other algae. So red and, br and brown algae and golden al algae, they are fully, they're only aquatic. There are, there are green algae that do spend some time on land. And so... They have to deal with the issue that water absorbs UV light. Other algal species that are free-floating, a lot of them green algae, <laughs> absorb some of those wavelengths of light. So functionally, they need different wavelengths or they need different pigments that are different than green algae so that they could absorb the light left over after green algae takes its share. Okay? Does that make sense? So a lot of your free-floating algal forms are green algae. They're taking their share of all of the visible light and converting that into chemical energy. And so red and brown algae, which tend to be deeper than, than your green algal forms, uh, have to take what's left, what green algae is left over. And so they need pigments that green algae don't have. So that green algae, those, if they had those same pigments, green algae would have already taken those wavelengths of visible light. Make sense? So functionally, that's why green al or brown algae, red algae, gold algae have different pigments. If you want to talk about it from the perspective of origins, if y the idea is that green algae and plants really do share an ancestor, you could explain it that way as well. Anyways, plenty of, plenty of ways to explain why plants don't have the same pigments as red and brown algae. All right. Any questions about that question? Man, y'all look like it's Monday. Mm -hmm. this, is one of my, this is one of the reasons why I love Mondays. 
because I look out here and it's like, I can see you, you're fighting it, right? You're like, you're exhausted and you really just want to take a nap, but you're like, you're fighting it. It's, it's awesome. I appreciate the effort. I mean, it's, it's just fantastic. All right, next framing question. Why do algae uh, produce drought resistant structures? So now this is focusing on, on solely green algae, right? We're talking about Archeplastida, green algae, land plants. Okay, land plants make sense, right? We call them land plants, they live on land. Land is not as wet as water, right? That makes sense? Cool, so we know why plants produce drought resistant structures. Well, why do, uh, why do algae? So then we can ask some questions. Well, why would you even live on land if it's so hard, right? If, if the ground is drier than water, why bother? Okay, and so uh, let's talk about some of the complications of living on land. Life on land is tough. It is. It's hard. It's hard. Some of the issues, you risk drying out. So you have what's called a risk of desiccation. Uh, gravity isn't balanced with buoyancy, right? Water actually helps buoy a lot of structures, including us, right? If you just relax in water, you'll float, right? And so it's nice. You don't have to worry about gravity as much. It's why uh, embryos and fetuses develop in a chamber full of fluid, right? So gravity does not have a, a huge impact on them and they can develop really rapidly. <sighs> yeah, UV light isn't filtered. So on land, there's no water that's absorbing some of that UV light. Uh, and gametes can't swim. So gametes, the sex cells, right? Your male sex cells, the sperm can't swim through water to get to the female sex cells on land. Unless, of course, fertilization happens internally, and I got that. But just on land, if you are a, a, an, an algae, or you are a plant, and you're used to just releasing pollen, which are, tend to be sperm grains, th they can't just swim to find female sex cells, okay? They've gotta move in some other way. It's complicated. Life on land is tough. So why do it, right? What are the advantages? Life on land does offer some rewards. You see what I did there? It's tough, but there are some benefits. Let's talk about this. UV light isn't filtered. The reason why that, that's one of the complications, right? That's what makes it tough. I love this. When you have something that's both positive and negative, right? It's hard that UV light isn't filtered because there's nothing to protect you. But it's nice that UV light isn't filtered because nothing's stealing your sunlight and making it harder for you to turn f electrical or photo energy uh, into chemical energy, right? And so it's, it's hard, but it's also really nice. It's like, if you're gonna go and sit out by the sun in the middle of the summer, then it's tough, but it's also really nice, right? And we don't even need sunlight. Imagine if you actually needed sunlight, sunlight to generate chemical energy. Uh, carbon dioxide is more abundant and more easily absorbed. Okay, there's plenty of carbon dioxide available in water, but there's more available in air, uh, and it's easier to absorb it. And then this is still true, that predation is lower on land than it is in water, less of a variety of predatory forms. Uh, it's harder for predators, right? Predators have to deal with uh, issues, um, the same way that plants would, but it, especially if you think about that plants would have been the first organisms to actually venture onto land. Would have ventured onto land before animals did, regardless of your view of origins, right? Plants show up day three, animals don't show up until day five, right? So they get a whole two days before things start eating them, or they get millions of years before things start get eating them. Either way, you've got an advantage, right? Predation is lower. So let's talk about how plants meet these difficulties in order to get these rewards. Uh, so they combat desiccation, drying out, uh, and gravity uh, through a couple of ways. One, alternation of generations. And we'll talk about this in more detail, but basically what it does is it almost forces you to keep the most delicate parts of your existence shielded within another structure. Okay, so we'll talk about alternation to generations, what that looks like, how it functions, how it varies among these groups. But living life this way almost requires 
that the, the most sensitive parts of your existence are sheltered in some kind of a structure as you're preparing for the other generation, as you alternate these generations. Gametophyte, sporophyte, gametophyte, sporophyte. Luckily for you and plants, there are only two generations. There are lots of animals that have three or four generations that alternate through, but we, we can't get into that much detail in animals to actually get to some of those. So it simplifies it. You're welcome. Um, plants also have what's called the apical meristem, which is at, in both the roots and in what's the shoot. So the roots and at the top of the stem where they have tissue that their only purpose is to rapidly divide. It's the only purpose of the apical meristem is just to rapidly divide, make growth happen really quickly. You are like, what kind of an advantage does that provide against desiccation or gravity? And it, it really helps with both because the instead of having all of your tissues, all of the cells having to worry about both growth and development and kind of maintaining normal function, taking part in reproduction, you separate it out. So you have the cells that are worried about the really important things like reproducing, like maintaining, they're protected. They're not near the outside of the structure. They're not going to lose their water more readily than cells that are near the outside of the structure. And those cells that are near the outside of the structure, all they're doing is growing and dividing. That's all they're doing. Okay? They're not building complex reproductive structures. They're not storing nutrients. They're just growing and dividing. And so the cells that are most susceptible to drying out are also cells that aren't going to kill you if they die, right? You're just not going to grow as fast. It's fantastic, right? Makes it to where the cells that are most likely to dry out and experience some kind of um, uh, stress because of that, they don't matter, right? If things get stressful and you start losing water, you just don't grow until right. things are a little <laughs> bit more damp and water is more readily available. Bless you. A waxy cuticle. So on the outside of a plant structure, they have a waxy substance, and wax is nonpolar, water is polar, so anytime you have a thick nonpolar structure, it makes it hard for water to cross it, which means it makes it harder for you to lose water. It's fantastic, right? Uh, algae don't, don't have this. And then lignin-infused walls. So lignin, uh, it, it varies in composition from group to group, but it is a structure. It's a chemical that hardens cell walls, it makes it to where gravity doesn't just pull the whole plant down, okay? And so it gives it some nice rigidity, some nice structure to hold up against gravity. We're, all, we're, almost, we're almost to our lecture break, so if, if you're, I mean, if you're hungry for it, it's coming soon, all right? Okay, so now we've dealt with, you know, why is it tough to live on land, but why would you want to do it anyways? How do plants do it? Well, now let's talk about why would algae produce drought-resistant structures? First off, some green algae species do survive on soil. So they can survive in areas where water isn't always there. You'll even find these, right? You've gone into intertidal areas, and there's just algae over rocks. The tide's out, so it's exposed to the air, right? You step on the rock, it's slippery, you fall, right? And you're like, ah, oh, it's so much fun, right? Interactive. Is that just me? Sorry. Um, and so green algae do that a lot better than other algal forms, including uh, this group, Corallis, or Corallis, uh, which is an order of green algae that is believed to represent some of the most closely related algal species to plants. And they actually do survive well on land for short stretches of time because they make nice drought-resistant structures. So they can withstand... Uh, losing some of their water. They can uh, endure being exposed to dry air. And so some of these structures, they've got lignin. Um, the embryophytes, these represent land plants, by the way. All land plants grouped together in a group called embryophytes. So they use lignin like some of the plants do, and they use what's called sporopollenin, which actually protects some of the most sensitive portions or sensitive parts of the life cycle of these algae in the same way plants do. Uh, plasmodesmata, these are junctions that connect neighboring cells together. So the shell, cells, the shells, the cells, not the shells, the cells can actually share nutrients and to share water so water moves more readily. Uh, and then fertilization is internal. 
So they don't always need water around in order for fertilization to happen, for the male gametes to find the female gametes. They actually fertilize internally and protect that developing structure. Okay. So why would green algae produce drought-resistant structures? Because some of those species live on land, at least for short stretches. And what's kind of cool is that some of those that are believed to be most closely related to land plants actually do that. But I'll tell you that that's the reason they're believed to be most closely related to land plants is because they can actually survive short stretches on land, which makes sense, right? You're like, well, if you want to move on to land, let's find some intermediate forms, right? That spend a little bit of time on land. You're like, man, that makes a lot of sense. And it looks really nice until you start looking at the DNA and then you realize it's a completely separate group that is the most genetically similar to land plants. Zygna metallis is the group of algae that are the most like plants genetically and they're very little like plants behaviorally and life structure wise. So now it's not quite as neat of a picture. You're like, oh cool, like we've got this group of green algae that actually spends some time on land. I bet that's the group that land plants came from, right? And that was the assumption for a long time. Like this is where land plants came from until you started looking in the DNA and then you realize these aren't very much like plants genetically. These are, but they're nothing like plants lifestyle-wise. Like, oh, it's not quite such a neat picture. But there's still something there, all right? Okay, time for a lecture break. You ready? I'm ready. You can start immediately talking to those around you. You don't need to sit on it and chew on it for a while by yourself. What I'd like for you to do this. I would like for you to make a list of reasons, okay? Make a list of reasons why not all photosynthetic organisms share a common ancestor, okay? See if you've got, we have, so far we've talked about quite a few photosynthetic organisms, right? We mentioned cyanobacteria when we were talking about bacteria. We talked about several last week when we were talking about protists, diatoms, dinoflagellates, golden algae, brown algae, red algae, green algae. Now we're talking about green algae and land plants, right? I would like for you to begin making a list of reasons why all photosynthetic organisms probably do not share a photosynthetic ancestor, okay? That is, you can root them all back to an organism that used photosynthesis, all right? Make a list of reasons, work with those around you, do yourself a favor, and physically write out this list, okay? Do yourself a favor. All right, take a couple of minutes. All right, what do we have? Why is it unlikely that all of our photosynthetic organisms share a photosynthetic ancestor? Yeah. 
Right. So, yeah, absolutely. There are organisms that they're chloroplasts. If you're going to try to explain where a chloroplast came from, if your view of origin requires that organisms couldn't be designed and created with them, then you have to come up with some explanation of where they came from. And if you want to do that, there are organisms that have different structures to their chloroplasts. And so if chloroplasts originated as free living organisms and developed from endosymbiosis, which I think there are some concerns with, but if that is true, there are some that look like their chloroplasts came from secondary endosymbiosis and not primary, meaning that they didn't just engulf a photosynthetic organism, they engulfed something else that engulfed a photosynthetic organism, meaning that picture is gonna be messy, right? Because in theory, our cells could do that, right? Could engulf something that is photosynthetic. And you actually have, not humans, but you have jellyfish that have done that. That their cells have engulfed a photosynthetic organism, sort of. It's really a, a whole tissue, like a whole section that surrounds photosynthetic organisms and enslaves them. But then you have coral that do that as well, so the idea is those jellies probably came from... Anyways, another story altogether. But in theory, we could do that, right? And then so what it would look like is if you looked at our chloroplasts, it would make it look like we and whatever organism we engulfed actually share a recent common ancestor because our chloroplasts are so similar. But really just what happened is we ate that organism and enslaved it, and that's why it looks so similar. Yeah, so secondary, tertiary, even quaternary... Uh, endosymbiosis complicates the picture a lot. Yeah. Uh, for some of the photosynthetic organisms, their common ancestor was not photosynthetic, and we know that. Because well, could it? But but how do you know? Uh, sorry, I cut you off. You said we know that, and then I just I got excited. Because other organisms that developed from that common ancestor were not photosynthetic, and it doesn't seem like they lost the ability. Well, all you have to do to lose the ability to photosynthesize is lose the chloroplast. And all the machinery that helps the chloroplast communicate with the nucleus. And, uh, yeah, but, I mean, I don't know if you would be able to tell whether an organism lost the chloroplast or whether it never had them in the first place. That, 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 would, that would be tough. There, I'm sure there are ways, um, but it would be tough. Now, ooh, I like this. This is an idea. This is a thought. So there are genes for proteins that function in the chloroplast in the nucleus, like there are for the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. So if they lost chloroplast, those genes or remnants of those genes would probably still be in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. And so you probably would be able to tell. Mm -hmm. I like that. I don't know of any specific I examples in which that is the case, but you, you actually probably could tell. Yeah. Okay, so we see photosynthetic organisms in like bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Um, that's, you definitely see it in bacteria, you definitely see it throughout uh, eukaryota. I don't know okay. if we find many examples but, here. But still, so bacteria are the oldest living organisms, and like, from assuming that worldview, like, the Earth, um, like, did not have oxygen at one point, which means they believe oxygen came from photosynthetic bacteria. Right. So you have photosynthetic bacteria that are developing really early on. Yeah, about and three. Then and, then there's, and then there's more change with evolution, and then they're developing again eukaryotes. So it doesn't look like it was... Right, so... You don't see the eukaryotes coming from the bacteria, like, there's too many steps in between. Sure, yeah, so the photosynthetic bacteria that we have, let's say this, they don't look like they're representative of this survival machine. Okay, so you have photosynthetic bacteria, you have photosynthetic organisms here, you have photosynthetic organisms here, and then you have some organisms here that enslave photosynthetic organisms and do it well. Uh, we do that when we build gardens, by the way. Um, and so you have these organisms, and so if, if, if you're going to root back to the ancestor of these groups and these photosynthetic bacteria, you've got to go all the way back to your original life form. Yeah, you which means really early. Right, which means your original survival machine has got to be photosynthetic, but which that's see, weird. Nobody, nobody thinks that. And don't we see that the original survival machines existed in an anaerobic? Well, that's what we assume. But that's what we right. assume. So yeah, that's inconsistent. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it would lead to some inconsistency. Okay, does that make sense? And so what what you have to do with 
all these different photosynthetic forms then is you have to either deal with it as convergence or as endosymbiotic events, right? And endosymbiosis, we talked about, there's some huge challenges, right? You've got to get machinery that's in the chloroplast into the nucleus and then some way for them to communicate. And the machinery necessary to do that doesn't exist. Okay? So there had to at some point be machinery to facilitate that that no longer exists, which is interesting. Is it possible? Sure. But it's interesting. And then it didn't just happen once to get some photosynthetic form that then diversified into a lot of other forms, but it's happened a lot of times. Right? That's interesting. That's a that's a hard sell for me, to be honest. That's a hard sell. I think it, a, an easier answer to that is what you're looking at is several unique, separate creations that were designed to be photosynthetic. But that's also a hard sell because that comes with some consequences. Yeah. So yeah, because like it, it keeps coming back to this idea of convergence, and you're saying like you feel like that's that's not really helping the evolution. So, like it, it's kind of it, it's it, it, well let's just say this the only way to explain it from an idea of universal common descent of rooting all life back is that for some reason there are certain forms that have to exist right and so that's really the only way to explain all of these instances of convergent evolution is that there there are just some forms that have to exist and you could explain it that way you can say that in order for an ecosystem to develop uh, that there are certain forms that have to exist. The problem with explaining it that way is it seems that what drives natural selection is not the desire for these organisms to play their role in an ecosystem, right? Yeah. Organisms aren't like, you know what? I need to be the most fit individual, produce the most offspring that are the best so that I can make sure this ecosystem functions. So I, I just, I don't know, I don't know how you could use that as an explanation for what would have driven it. I don't know. But my, my mind is very tiny, right? It's very underdeveloped. So I just, I might be missing something. But I, I just, I don't know how you could do that. Okay. All right, so does that make sense? Okay, there are a lot of instances of photosynthetic organisms. Nobody thinks that they all root back to a single photosynthetic ancestor. So either photosynthesis developed a lot of times, by a lot I mean a lot of times, dozens, maybe hundreds of times, or what you're looking at is separate, specific designs that were meant to be photosynthetic. So, all right. So I mentioned that alternation of generations actually helps protect from water loss. And so the way you move from one generation to the other, which the two generations are gametophyte and sporophyte. Gametophytes produce gametes. Sporophytes produce spores. Gametophytes are haploid, meaning they have one copy of the genome. Sporophytes are diploid, meaning they have two copies of the genome. Diploid, die, meaning two. I don't know where haploid, I don't, I don't know the root for that. Okay, But in order to move from one generation to the other, you go to a single cell. A single cell leaves the sporophyte and develops into the gametophyte. A single cell leaves the gametophyte, fuses with another single cell that left a different gametophyte to form the sporophyte. So the only way to move from one generation to the next is by doing it through a single cell. This is the most sensitive and fragile portion of the life cycle for these organisms. And what it does is it allows it and almost requires that this part be kept within this portion of the life cycle, okay? And it's, it's one thing that actually protects the very sensitive portions of the life cycle. So here's uh, an example of a uh, sporophyte in moss. We'll talk about this in a little bit, but moss, the dominant portion of the life cycle is the gametophyte stage. And so the sporophyte tends to be really small. And in fact, for moss, this is the sporophyte. So you may have this single moss individual that can be pretty big, pretty spread out. They don't grow real tall, but pretty spread out. And each sporophyte is just a teeny tiny little portion of that producing spores. Okay? And that's what you're looking at here. A lot of variety to how this looks and how it functions. Here's the apical meristem, the portion that I said is doing what? What is this doing? Growing, Growing like crazy. 
and this is at the outside of your organism. And so these are going to be the cells that are most susceptible to what? To drying out, right? And they're also the cells that are least necessary for the survival of the organism. Because all they're doing is growing. All they're doing is leading to the growth of the individual. And so if they dry out and they die, no big deal. You just don't grow during that time. And so you find a lot of plants actually don't grow during really dry spells. They'll lose their leaves, kind of go dormant, um, or brown up like your grass and go dormant. And then once water's plentiful again, they'll come out and start rocking life again. So here are some of the green algal forms. And so these representatives, this, this comes right out of the text, like almost all of my diagrams do. And if they don't, I, I note them and say, this is, I put this in here because I think it's better than the one in, anyways. Um, so these are some of the green algal forms that are believed to be most similar to plants. And the reason for that is they're most similar genetically. But these are just, they're, they're very unique and have very specialized structures in addition to uh, to plants. Here's ulva, which is sea lettuce. You can eat it. It's delicious. So, um, interesting. Yeah, here's another uh, representative of that group of plants that actually can spend some time in dry environments. And so structurally and behaviorally, if plants actually behave, uh, but structurally seem to be very similar to plants, however, are not the most closely related to it genetically. And so this is in genus Cara. There are a number of species inside of there. And uh, yeah, again, something that a group that functionally seems very similar to plants, but genetically is not the most closely related to plants. These are the most genetically related to plants, but not very related to plants structurally or life history wise. Did you have a question? That, I mean, it looks like you're ready. You know, you're just going to launch that hand up. All right. I'm having fun. I hope you're having fun. Did I already tell you happy Monday? Yeah. I love Mondays. Monday. I love Mondays. I feel like more really fun things should happen on Mondays. Like, you know, you've got like Taco Tuesday. Who doesn't love Taco Tuesday? You've got a lot of places that'll have like 50 cent wing Wednesdays, right? But n nobody really celebrates Mondays, except for, Monday. what's that? Munchie. Monday. Yeah, and then there's Monday Bites. I don't know if you ever went to that out in the Owl Valley used to be Lancaster City Park. Now it's Sergeant Stephen Owen Memorial oh, yeah. Park. But they've got a bunch of food trucks out there on Mondays. They throw, sh show a movie, yeah. put a little blow-up things. Fantastic. So not a lot going, out, going on out in the Owl Valley. So when something like that happens, you just show up. It's a big deal. All right. So why can mosses grow where there isn't any soil? Wonderful question. Plants are divided into two main groups. You have seedless plants. And I bet you can imagine what the other group is. Seed plants, right? And so seedless plants, you have non-vascular forms, the bryophytes. Uh, and these are believed to have developed in what's called the Ordovician. And so there's something I need to teach you, but it's going to wait for a second, OK? We're just we're going to throw out some terms, and, and we'll get to those. I'll, I'll put them in a nice little package that hopefully you can, you can digest well. And then you have the vascular forms. So these are lycophytes, pterophytes uh, that, that dominate the Silurian and beyond. So you've got two different types of seedless plants, but seedless plants represent one group of your plants. So you have non-vascular forms, the bryophytes, vascular forms, lycophytes, pterophytes, both of these seedless plants, meaning they don't have what? Wonderful. Nailed it, right? Critical thinking at its finest. I'm not being sarcastic. That is wonderful. Take, take those low-flying, low-flying, low-hanging fruit, low-flying fruit. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> uh, but take them. Take them. Right? Pull that down and chew on it. Uh, and then you have seed plants. Seed plants we'll talk about next week. We'll leave that entire discussion till then. Now, we need to talk about bryophytes because mosses, they are bryophytes. So the gametophyte stage, and remember, gametophyte is just one of those generations. Gametophyte, sporophyte. What do gametophytes produce? Gametes. And they are haploid, meaning they have one copy of their genome. They produce gametes. What do sporophytes produce? Spores. Uh, so gametophytes, um, the gametophytes is the dominant 
life stage, the dominant generation in bryophytes. And bryophytes do not have tracheids. Tracheids are specialized cells that are really well designed for holding, storing, which I don't, there's no difference between holding and storing, storing and transporting water. Okay, so you've got this group of organisms and they do not have cells that are well designed for storing and transporting water. Meaning that bryophytes are probably really bad at doing what? Storing and transporting water. That makes sense? Okay. Add to that, they don't have roots. Okay, so if they can't store and transport water very well, why have roots that are basically designed to absorb, store, and transport water, right? If you don't have the cells that can do it, you're not going to produce the overall structures that do it. So if they don't have roots, they can grow anywhere. They don't need soil, right? They can grow right on the surface of a rock. They can grow on rooftops. You have yourself a living uh, house, right? Just have a whole bunch of moss growing on top of the roof. And so they can do that because they lack roots. And they lack roots because they couldn't really put them to use because they don't have the cells well designed to store and transport water. Make sense? It does, right? OK, now I need to teach you something. That, there's no space. OK. So if you're going to look at the geological column, that is, you're going to start digging into rock, and you're going to start describing it, you need a way to separate the whole crust, all of the rock that's available, into different manageable sections. Okay? And so we do it this way. We separate the, um, the, the, the whole geological column basically into four eras. Yeah, era. Okay. The most recent is the Cenozoic. It's approximately 65 million years. Million. And then you have the Mesozoic, which is approximately 250 million years. And then you have the Paleozoic. This is approximately 550 million years. And then your fourth, and this is in years ago. Years ago. And then this one we tend to call the Precambrian. But there are other words, and some people will separate it into multiple eras. But I'm going to do four for simplicity. Cenozoic, which this would be our current era, all the way back to 65 million years ago. The Mesozoic, between 65 and about 250. And then the Paleozoic, between two, about 250 to 550. And the Precambrian and everything before that. Okay? And you're like, okay, so now we have all of the crust, believed to be somewhere around 4.5 billion years old, right? If you're going to take an, an old Earth, or somewhere in the thousands of just our dating mechanisms are wrong, we'll come back to that. But this is a long chunk of time, right? About 250 million years to about 550 million years. And that's, that's a huge chunk of time. 300 million years, that's a long time. Even in the context of 4.5 billion years, that's still a long time. So we take this and we separate it into periods. And this is separated into six periods. The Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, the Devonian, the Carboniferous, and the Permian. Okay? So we take this huge era, the Paleozoic era, and we split it up into six smaller bite-sized chunks. And each of these, I mean, you're looking at 300 million years separated into six. Each of them is about 50 million years. There are some that are smaller, some that are longer, but they're all about 50 million years. And so if bryophytes show up, this non-vascular forms, these bryophytes show up in the Ordovician, this is what you're talking about. 
So basically, they would show up in rocks that are that are formed during this time. Okay. And I want you to know, no matter what your view of origins is, this is a very helpful schema. Okay, a very helpful scheme. Schema is plural. A very helpful scheme to kind of discuss through these things. There's differences in terms of what forms these different eras and periods and what are you actually talking about. But actually referring to these rock sections by these names is really helpful. Okay? It's a helpful thing. Okay, any questions with this? Okay. I will tell you this. There are probably no actual fossilized remains of bryophytes in the Ordovician. There are some that some will argue that are actually remnants of these, but basically there just aren't any. But other plants start showing up here, and so if the bryophytes are the most primitive plants, which they would need to be, right? They don't have seeds. They don't, they're non-vascular, right? So they're simpler. They should be the first original plants they would need to show up sometime here. But you don't actually find a record of them. But that's when they would need to show up. All right, so here is a figure table uh, out of the text. It is fantastic, okay? And by fantastic, I mean it's just, it's just a great tool to very quickly separate and structure up your plants. Now, the unfortunate thing about plants is the same thing you have with, with fishes. And you're like, what is plants and fishes, like, how are you going to connect these two? Watch, I'm going to do it right now. You ready? Over 90% of all plants are in this one group here. So you're like, we have all these groups, and almost every plant I'm going to interact with is in this box here. And that's true. And it's unfortunate. It's a reality. But it's still, I mean, you're, you're still talking about hundreds of species that are here. So they're important, right? Even though over 90% of them are in this category here. So I have the same thing with fishes. Um, so with fishes, almost all of your fishes are teleos. And uh, I know it means nothing to you right now. Maybe it does. Uh, but you have the same thing with fishes. But that doesn't mean your sharks and your rays and your rat fishes. It doesn't mean that they're not important just because they're not part of the group making up over 90% of fishes, right? Sharks are pretty awesome, right? Sharks, I mean, we dedicate a whole week on the Discovery Channel to them. Right? They don't dedicate a whole week on the Discovery Channel to Telios, even though they make up most of our fish groups. Are you having a problem with fishes? No, I like fish. Um. No, I mean they're using that word, because most people have a problem with fishes. It's like cheeses. Jesus. So let me say this, and then we'll be done. And then, well, actually, I'll, I'll, maybe I should answer your question first. Just Quick question. Is it 90% by species or by biomass? By, by species. By species. Yeah, by species. But probably by biomass as well. Yeah. Okay. So, if you have multiple fish of the same species, fish is plural. Right? So, if you have one goldfish, six goldfish. But if you have multiple fish of several species, fishes is plural. Which is the same with cheese. If you have multiple pieces of cheddar cheese... Cheese is plural. But if you have cheddar and Swiss and Colby Jack and Gruyere, right, it's cheeses. Who knew? Yeah. 